and so this okay so okay so let me just uh, can everybody see uh yes okay so i get yeah. excellent i get this out of the way and uh, so this optimal chaotic dynamics and then this check map and then what the hell is this rss model and I've been at it since 2022 years, actually now. And um, one, one very smart guy in the Queensland told me, surely it couldn't be so difficult for two decades. You are working on this silly map from the zero one to zero one. So, so I want to give, I, I, I divide the talk. Tell me how much talk do I, how much time do I have and how do you want me to structure it? Uh, so it's completely up to you. I mean, the canonical time is roughly an hour, oh. but because we're on Zoom, you can talk if you want for two hours and people, <laughs> people can disappear at their option. Okay, okay. So no, no, I won't take an hour and I'll try to be coherent. I will divide it into, I'll divide the talk into three parts after I finish the slides. The slides are just for to show you that I have done my homework and I have been conscientious. But I really want to talk to you guys about the problems, two, three problems. And that's what I want to communicate. So I won't take more than an, I won't take, I'll take about 40 minutes. So, uh, uh, so let me first show you the slides. Uh, so this you have already seen. And this is a work of Mel, and we were very much inspired by this work, and more conjecturally with two papers of Lagarius and co-authors. Now, these are number theoretic papers, and they are asymmetric on asymmetric tent maps. And uh, I am sure, like many mathematicians, if I, if I tell Lagarius and company, one of them used to be uh, my colleague when I was at Illinois in the, in the 80s, Porta. He would say, what have economists got to do with what we are, what we are doing? In some sense, it's related to Mel's, uh, Mel's uh, uh, comment that about whether this is economics in the sense of cycles and unemployment and wages and infrastructure, or is just some mathematical uh, problem under the, uh, with economic terminology or the economic vernacular. And I, let's keep this hanging. Let's keep this question hanging because it goes to the heart of what mathematical economics is. And this geometry as an engine of analysis, I want to emphasize. So this is one slide, you have seen this. And this I just wrote outline of the talk, but I'm not going to follow the outline. And these are these five lectures. So I copied some things from the slide. So if uh, this is something which you got, I can leave uh, afterwards, this is this RSS model and the check map. So the first thing is what is this check map and what's this RSS model? Now, since uh, Ross is here and you are interested in non-standard analysis and so on, there is a problem here for non-standard analysis. And that's my first thing which I want to talk about. And that's uh, Jerry Kiesler. K Jerry Kiesler has a paper on this, and that is the consonance, or if you like, dissonance between continuous time and discrete time. So, what I want to talk to you guys is a very dramatic implication, uh, uh, very dramatic uh, 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 dissonance between this RSS model in continuous time and RSS model in discrete time. So that's one, 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 one thing. And then I want to talk, the second to topic is I want to show how Mel, Mel's beautiful theorem uh, for we are all, we were all inspired, my co-authors and I, uh, on eventual periodicity. And we try to apply to economic theory. So that I want to tell you a little bit about that application. Uh, that goes again to Mel's thing. Is it economics? Is it not economics? So I want to keep this, uh, is this really economics question hanging? And uh, the, third, the third one is a, is a paper which Mel requested a reprint. It just got published. And I want to just tell you about that theorem and an open problem. So really, if I had to do the outline again, it would be this Jerry Kiesler's uh, result, there would be the um, Nathanson result, 
And the third would be uh, an open problem of a result that Ashwin, Rajan, Liu Chun Deng, and I just proved. So this would be the tripartite structure. But the structure of the slides is are, 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 are as shown. And please feel free to me, uh, free for me, uh, please feel free to interrupt me uh, or shout out. Uh, I mean, otherwise I get uh, all um, caught up with, the, with, the, with my own voice and then I, I have no problems talking to myself for hours. So I don't want to subject you to this. So please, please interrupt and uh, put me on, on, on when I go astray. So this is the motivation. So this, I just copied, you know, these five lectures. So what the hell I was talking about. And it was very interesting in 2011. Economists know this simple intersection. I have a paper, a photograph of Samuelson, which is delightful, uh, called the cobweb map. And um, so that's how uh, this, these lectures began. But I, it has these specific, uh, in, uh, specific functional forms. So the function specific functional form will be a mapping continuous and piecewise linear mapping from the 0, 1 interval to the 0, 1 interval. And then there are these number theoretic things. And I shall, these are all the maps which have been applied. So the tent map, so I don't have to show you what this, this tent map is. And then the asymmetric tent map. So uh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's an asymmetric tent map. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Dajani and Krikamp for an ignoramus about number theory like myself. It is part of these, you know, these American mathematical monographs for undergraduates. And they describe these Bernoulli shifts and logistic maps in, in, in the number theory mode. But we are interested in the check map and the pan map. And then the Nathanson's composite. And this was for my graduate students. So I, um, you guys know what I would know in any question of dynamics, I'm happy to expand uh, the periodicity of a, of a, it's not a periodicity of a map. This is wrong. It's uh, you, the periodicity of the orbit. And then the Lee York theorem, the Sharkovsky's theorem, and then the stability of orbits and this whole question of what is Lee or chaos, and that has become now, uh, rather than tell a theorem, it has become a folk phrase. Uh, then the question of a scrambled set, entropy, topological chaos, uh, you know, the topological versus ergodic chaos, lap numbers, invariant measures, Lyapunov number. So in a sense, I'm trying to tell you that this was being taught to graduate students in economics who are not really math even mathematical economists. So this shows in some sense the importance of this, of this, uh, of dynamics. Uh, lecture two, piecewise continuous functions, indeterminacy in the definition of simplicity and of chaos. And this is the central limit theorem, the invariant measure. So there is this RSS model and the gale mckenzie reduced form model. So if you will bear with me, I want to just, uh, how shall I say? Uh, I want to uh, talk of this RSS model. Uh, uh, this is a British economist, Joan Robinson, who wrote a book in 1956 uh, uh, called The Accumulation of Capital. She's a Marxist and they didn't give her a Nobel Prize. She's a very interesting character. There is a wonderful book, Joan Robinson and the Americans. And so you will get a lot of gossip if you are interested. Uh, Bob Solo is... Um, is a Nobel laureate, uh, still alive and active and see, but over 90 years old, a man of great accomplishment. And um, he got the Nobel for uh, economic dynamics and um, also empirical work and so on. And Srinivasan um, was a chairman at Yale, Indian economist from the Indian Statistical Institution, Institute. So this RSS model was a model at which Cambridge, Massachusetts and Cambridge, England threw mud pies or snowballs at each other. Actually, it became rather, rather more vicious than that uh, because this was this left-wing, right-wing business 
on, on, on intricacies of capital theory. And this, I want to talk of the essence of this model. And so let me get to it and in an honest way, try to communicate and please feel free to ask me to, uh, to uh, clarify. So maybe I should, uh, uh, Mel, give me a, uh, help me out here. Shall I do it on the whiteboard or shall I do it verbally? Or shall I do both? Um. So I have no idea what it means to do anything on a whiteboard since I've never seen or used one. Let me let me try. Let me try that. So I so now you see it works like this. I stop share, and then I go again to screen share, and you see I have a whiteboard, and I uh, no I on, don't. I click oh. on that whiteboard. Now. Okay, now I see it. Okay, and now I I start writing. And uh, so the so I'm now let's see how I do. I you write uh, with your mouth? Yeah, no, no, no. I have a I have a pen. So I have this R S S model. Okay, looks good. Okay, and then it's two sector. I I will make all of this precise. So now first question. This is going to be of of great importance. Discrete time. So T is equal to now, uh, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. So there's nothing more. Every period, so uh, every period, a unit of labor. So Pakistanis, one unit of, uh, some unit of Pakistanis descend on the US economy and uh, live for a period and pass away. And another group then comes, um, lives for a period and passes away. So this is labor. This is exogenously given. One, 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 one. Now this labor, this unit of labor can be made, in, can be made into machines. And this is a linear technology. So A units of labor make one machine. This is one parameter, A units of labor, one machine. And I'm A units of labor. And, or, or rather not and, or one unit of labor and one machine make one unit of consumption good. So you see, this is the problem. There's an allocation problem. I have these, these Pakistanis there, I can put them to work to make machines, or I can put them to work along with the machine to, uh, to uh, uh, make a consumption good. I eat the consumption good. Machines depreciate. At the rate D. A is, uh, so this, this is the beauty of this whiteboard. I can get rid of these things and I can again go to draw and I can say A is greater than greater than zero and un unrestricted. So really it's a toy model, you see. It is, uh, uh, if you have no machines now, so th there's an initial, initial stock of machines, initial stock of machines. Just checking the uh, depreciation rate, that letter is a D? D, D, D. D, very good. So if I have a unit of machine now, it will become one minus D next period. I lose D, D of the machine evaporates. Half of the machine evaporates and then another half of that will evaporate and so on. So I want to put 
and I, you don't need any, this again goes back to Mel's question. You don't need any high powered economics here. Every period I have this resource of labor, this, uh, it lasts only one period. It is perfectly divisible. I can make machines or I can make the consumption good if I have machines around. If I, have don't, if I don't have machines around, I better make some machines and not eat that period. And then I am interested in the part of consumption over the whole, over uh, infinite horizon. Let us make things dif slightly difficult for ourselves and say there is no discount. So the idea is to allocate the labor between the machines and the production to maximize the production over the long term? Yeah, indeed, it is to, to uh, allocate the labor between the machine sector and the consumption goods sector to maximize the part of consumption over the, all, over the whole horizon. But now the bloody thing may not converge. So you are not maximizing a function. You are maximizing some path. If you were going to use a discount rate, then it would it would uh, it would function it would uh, uh, converge and you would be maximizing a function. So it's an infinite time horizon problem. So let me just write it out. It is you are um, it is uh, uh, maximum t equals zero to infinity of and now please note I have a and d. I will have the discount factor. So rho, rho is discount factor. And rho is between 0 and 1. So this is rho t. And some, some function of the, uh, uh, of the consumption good. Again, uh, just checking. Discount means that the further something is in the future, the less it matters. That's exactly what it means. Very good. That's exactly what it means. And let there be a utility. So this is very good. I, I if the, the, judging from this, I, I now I show you how this simple toy model has all kinds of number theoretic intricacies. That's the whole point of my talk. That's one point. The second point of my talk is I did this with uh, with the um, discrete time. I could write it with continuous time. And there is, therein lies a dissonance. And the third part of my talk, if I can get to it, is this open problem. So but let's continue with this, with this setting. So rho of t, and it should really be the consumption good which I eat. So that's what I'm maximizing. But you see the consumption good now can be written as a function of the machines I have and the machines I have today and the machines I have tomorrow. If, for example, the machines I have today is xt and tomorrow I have x1 minus t. I'm sorry, if I, I have today machines, let me just write, if I have a machines xt today and tomorrow I have uh, xt plus one equals one minus d xt, suppose this is so, then I've had a party. I took all my labor and did not put them in the machine sector. I put them all in the uh, uh, making consumption goods. It means I had enough, uh, I had enough machines and I used this technology of one, ma one machine, one ma person uh, to get one consumption good. It is what is called this Leon TF technology, uh, uh, machine and labor like this. So one machine, one unit of labor. So I have these production, uh, I saw these contour maps for the, um, for the machine sector. So this is the machine sector. The, uh, the, I mean, this is the consumption goods sector. The machine sector is very easy. That's machines today and I can make them and I can make them into, uh, if I have no machines, then I have one over a amount of machines tomorrow. 
And if I have a certain amount of machines, they, they depreciate. So I can have something like this, XT plus one XT. So the point I'm making is how much I enjoy, how much of the consumption good I enjoy in this period can be written up as a function of XT and XT my XT plus one some function of this. And then, so the problem is R max and XT and XT plus one is an element of some set D and XT is greater than zero. Or if you like, let me put it another way. D is a subset of, uh, uh, D is a subset of R2 plus. So I have machines today, I have machines tomorrow, and there is a technology. And the technology is given by this linear thing on the machine sector and this uh, King uh, Leontief thing in the consumption goods sector. And I am given initial machines. So if you will allow a piece of, uh, allow some dramatics on my part, this is Japan totally bombed. I have no machine. There are these Japanese running around. After one year, they will, they, they, they will be replaced by another group of Japanese. And they can be, these Japanese can be used to make machines. If there are no machines around, that's it. They just have to make machines. Machines. If there are machines around, then they will um, use, uh, uh, partly they will put the labor with, on those machines. There may be so many machines around that they are, not all can be used. Or part of them they will put, uh, uh, put uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in making uh, machines. And so now the question is, what's the optimal path? That's the question. Remember, it's a toy model. I have only, the beauty of this whiteboard is you also have colors. So I have only this guy and I have this guy. And I, so this goes to May's famous 1975 lecture, the how the complicated dynamics from simple models, very complicated dynamics from simple models. They're very simple model. Economically, it is uh, uh, actually most models, uh, when you reduce them to their essence, are economically rather uh, primitive and impoverished. But for the discounted case, I have just three parameters. Uh, two guys within the interval and one A. And the beauty of this, it all depends on one minus A. So this is my 45 degree line. This is my, if I have machines today, they become one minus D machines tomorrow. So this is my depreciation part. So I can either spend all my labor here. And so the machines will depreciate or I don't eat and make only all the machines here. So really at each period, the problem, as I put it here, the, as Mel summarized it, the, given any XT, the problem is to choose a path in this set. This is my D. So this is the this is the this is the problem. So what would be the optimal policy for this? And now comes this was the discounted case. This was the discounted. There is an undiscounted case. And this undiscounted case goes back to Ramsey's famous paper. The, yes, the same Ramsey. He wrote three papers, two papers in economics and one paper in sort of in economics. The one paper is on probability. Uh, so he wrote on optimum growth, which is what I'm doing and on optimum taxation, which I'm not doing. So in terms of optimum growth, he said discounting is a weakness of the imagination because he had a planner's model in mind. And he says, you are maximizing the forest or whatever you are maximizing. Why would you discount the consumption of future generations? Now, if you don't have a discount factor, then you see this row will be one. You don't discount. Any period is the same. So it won't converge. So how do we talk of maximal paths? 
And then you have a criterion. And the criterion is it should not be overtaken. That there is no path which for every epsilon, you, you are maximizing the limb soup for the limb. Inf, they are called the overtaking criteria. So the irony is that for the existence of a maximal plan, of maximal program, so any path will be a program for a, a, for a, for the discounted case, the existence of a program is easy to show. It will be a, just maximizing a function using product topologies so that you can do continuous function on a compact set and it will be fine. For the undiscounted case, the existence problem is difficult because uh, there is no function. You are, there are paths and you want to have essentially undominated path and you want to choose the criterion of what domination is. So there are these weakly maximal and strongly maximal, depending on whether you work with limb inf and limb soup. And um, in, if the criterion is too strong, there does not exist an optimal program. And with the right amount, it, there does exist an optimal program. So this is all, this is rather obvious. And here again, there is room for non-standard analysis because those criteria and that axiomatization of overtaking criteria, there might be room for non-standard analysis here, at least in terms of simplicity of exposition, maybe also something new. But we are not just interested in the existence of the optimal program. We are interested in the characterization of the optimal what do these optimal programs look like? In particular, are they chaotic? Do they converge? Are they stable? So you have a trajectory and you have an orbit. So in some sense, the optimality consideration depends on the depends on the on what path you choose. So there are two aspects. So this is where I would like to, uh, I think it's a point uh, which should be distinguished. When mathematicians work with dynamical systems, they take a dynamical system. So that's okay. So I have a, a map, so the tent map, zero one to zero one. So this is my 45 degree line. There's my symmetric tent map. There's my symmetric, uh, there's my uh, unsymmetric and uh, asymmetric tent map, which is, which is uh, studied by Lagarius and company, uh, and so on. The economists impose on themselves, or the economists who work in this area, impose on themselves that they don't want any old ad hoc, they call it ad hoc ad hoc policy function. They want a policy function rooted in these optimization problems, but in this particular optimization problem. And so the first step would be, what is the optimal policy? What does the planner do? He wants to allocate all, these, all this labor in this whole thing, discounted or undiscounted. And uh, that's the issue. So maybe I, I pause here. Any questions or clarifications you want me to go to? I am doing okay, I think, for time because it's uh, it's three three thirty five. But this is important. The model is important, and uh, if I'm if I'm not getting through with the model to you, then there is later. It's, it's, it will be okay, but it will be good if. If there is, uh, if if you have any questions, those are it's time to ask now. I'm just making sure again the undiscounted case. You haven't actually defined what it means to have a best program, right? They have not defined. I have not okay. defined. There is a beautiful, and so that's why I have to contain myself and then uh, use my time accordingly. This I, I want to leave. I want to leave it to you. You say okay. Yeah, there are many there are many different definitions that could be used and the indeed, different answers. Indeed. Okay. Indeed. Yes. 
and if I had, didn't have this uh, trauma of, uh, of uh, waiting for my COVID test, I would at this point shown you a paper of Brock. Uh, maybe I will show you where he shows, the, he defines all these things. I, I have all the slides, so, so I can do it. But you are absolutely right. I've not defined it. I've not defined it. Uh, okay, so let's proceed. At this point, let me throw Kiesler into the mix. So, but before I do that, this is a model. It's good that I talked of Joseph Stieglitz by chance, but this model, Joseph Stieglitz worked on it in his MIT dissertation in 1968. And it has a very, again, going back to Mel's comment, a very fancy title, the choice of technique in a socialist economy with full employment or some such fancy thing. But it was a simple application. And if I, I would like to say misapplication of Pontryagin's maximum principle. And Stieglitz formulated the problem in continuous time. So everything remains the same. The only thing is the integral. You have the same technology. I have this labor at any point in time and I can either uh, uh, use it on machines or use it to produce machines. And uh, uh, I, uh, if there's discounting, I integrate over all the time and then find out how I should do the allocation. In fact, in 1968, Stieglitz had a finite amount of machines, I'm, I'm sorry, a finite type of machines, which could be ranked. There were some machines which were more effective in producing the consumption good than others. But of course, because they were more effective, they also needed more labor. So now the question, the problem becomes very interesting because now the AI, there would be types of machines with different AIs attached to them and different amounts of consumption goods, BI attached to them and the depreciation rates attached to them. So that's why this choice of techniques business. And he solved this problem. It is a, it's like pinning butterfly to the wheel. And he solved it with pure intuition. What I buy, buy uh, it, uh, you will say can't be called pure intuition because he did use Pontryagin's maximum principle, right? Answer yes, but he misused it. <laughs> and he misused it in the following way because he used it as a, as a folk theorem, not as a, not as a theorem whose hypothesis need to be verified and things like this. So he solved it, and this also goes to the next question. Forgive me, I don't know your name who asked me. May I have your name who asked me? Not Mel, but the other person. Moshe. Uh, Moshe, okay. So, so he, Moshe, it, go, it goes back to your question about, um, uh, I have not specified for you uh, the program. So what Joe Stieglitz did was solve through Pontryagin's principle, the discounted case, got the solution, and then said, in the undiscounted case, I just put rho equals one. And look what happens to the solution. And of course, the solution has an economic interest. So he said, I have solved the discounted and the undiscounted case. But of course, if, it's, uh, if it is uh, undiscounted, it will blow up. So that solution, you have yet to show it is the solution. So let's stay, because I want to bring out the dissonance. Let's stay with the discounted case in Stieglitz's analysis. And Stieglitz proved, and later one can check it, he proved, uh, check it rigorously, that there will be a cutoff in types of machines. Below the cutoff, even if machines are available and they are useful, they will not be used. Above the cutoff, the types will be used and they will depreciate, but they will not be produced. 
there will be only one type. And remember, I have only three parameters in the model. A, B, and in the many types case, the amount of consumption good that is being produced. There will be one type, the best type, the effective type, the cost minimizing type or the golden rule type of machine that is both used and produced and goes to a steady state value. So the optimum path will be constant. So this is quite a mouthful. I have used this two sector model to tell you about the end sector or the, uh, the two sector uh, or single type of machine model to a many type of machine model and shown you something which Stieglitz proved, the Stieglitz policy that everything is hunky-dory. You don't need to worry about different types. There is an optimal type. And uh, you will, after time, once your machines are all, the good ones are exhausted, you will just keep on, um, uh, on producing and using and producing and using and producing. So then in 2000, Tapan Mitra, the late Tapan Mitra, very, uh, very distinguished economist from Cornell, mathematical economist. I told him, I can't understand Stieglitz's arguments because there's a lot going on. You see, you need a topology. How do you make exactly Moshe's question and so on, so on. So Tapan Mitra said for the substance of the problem, why do we need to do continuous time? Let's do discrete time. And he said, the theory for discrete time is there. It is called the gale mckenzie model. You just apply that theory. So he gave it to me like a student's exercise. And to my embarrassment, for three months, I could, do, I could not solve it. So finally, I said, let me just go to one type of machine, which is what I have shown you here now. And there, one could quickly prove that forget about the optimal po policy converging, the optimal policy yields a two period cycle or use, uses an n period cycle. And this is now where Mel's paper is coming in. So all what I described in continuous time as hunky-dory is getting upended in discrete time. And it's very easy to show what is the problem. So let me show that to you geometrically. And I will take another five minutes and, and then uh, uh, call it, uh, open it for, for, uh, for discussion. So the, 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 if I may uh, draw it here, let me just be careful here. Let me just do this here. So this is my XT, machines today. This is my machines tomorrow. And this is my 45 degree line. And this is with the depreciation rate. This is one minus D. And this is one over A. These are parallel. And this is one unit of labor. Remember, every period, one unit of labor is coming in. And this is my technology D. And so I have to choose a path. If I am given, if I am given machine, a certain amount of machines, I have a choice between all of this. Do I have a I do I not put any of the labor into the into the machine sector and just uh, uh, depreciate? Do I choose this one? So uh, if I have this much machines uh, next, and I don't, I choose this point, then next period I will have this much machine because I use the 45 degree line and so on and so on. Or I can not eat and produce only machines and so on. So what will be the optimal policy? And the optimal policy is given, and now there you go, it is given by this map. And this is a steady state amount of machines. So 
So if I start with this, the optimal policy is to keep at it. If I start with more than this, so let me use green. If I start with more than this, then the optimal policy is this, which is to say next period, it will be this. And then next period, it will be that and so on. So I have this check map. I have to analyze the properties of this check map. And one can already see that if this check map and this check map is depending on B and A, you can see that it, it um, if, if the parameters are right and it's 45 degree line, this line, this arm of the check map, then there'll be a two period cycle. If the arm of the check map, if the check map is like this, So forget about a nice, well-behaved Stieglitz policy function. There'll be chaos. There'll be optimal chaos. So this is the dissonance. So let me move away now. Let me pause here and then now summarize and show you the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Kiesler paper. Any comments, questions? Okay. So Mel has, let me just show you, let me just show, to tell you about Mel's research. Uh, one thing, one yeah. thing I wonder about is the continuous case in some way, a limit of discrete time. I mean, suppose you were taking time intervals, which were closer and closer together and doing it for, you know, appropriately scaling and doing it for each case. Would you get somehow the continuous case as a limit? This is the question. This is a question. Thank you for articulating. This is the reason why I am bringing in Kiesler. And this is why it's this Kiesler's paper on discrete versus continuous time. This is what I am calling asymptotic implementation. Can Stieglitz's continuous time solution be asymptotically implemented by the discrete time solution when the intervals become arbitrarily small? And the answer is no, in some sense, in some sense, no, in some sense, yes. In what sense, no, in what sense can it be implemented? Well, I am getting in discrete time cycles and chaos. In fact, you give me, because Mel's theorem is very beautiful. He says, you choose any periodicity you like, and I will give you a map from the zero one to zero one, a chaotic map, a map that has Lee or chaos. I will give you a map which for almost every initial point will be eventually periodic with the amount of, with the number of, with the periodic uh, periodicity that you have chosen. So now in that way, this RSS map is very interesting in that you give me any periodicity and I can construct a check map, which is to say I can find an RSS model, which is to say I can find B and A, such that for that model, the optimal path will be one with that periodicity. But in continuous time, there is no periodicity. So somehow these, the discrete time business, when you make the interval go to, to zero, are getting squished. So what is getting squished? What is getting squished is what makes this dynamic work. And that dynamic in discrete time is the rate of transformation which the technology allows 
between machines today and machines tomorrow. So if I have no consumption, if I have machines, there's no machines now, I have one over A tomorrow. But, but then if they are going, so there is a sufficient statistic, uh, a sufficient statistic which is the slope of this, this arm. You see, this arm is, is, is a stabilizing one, but this left arm is the one that causes all the chaos, all the, all the difficulty. And the slope of this is, um, I have now one over A minus one minus B. So it's a very simple model as Lord May has said. So uh, if A is small, this is becoming very, very large. So this slope is very, very large. And this is one minus A. It, this is the sufficient statistic. Now, in, this is the rate of transformation of machines today into machines tomorrow. But in continuous time, there is no today and tomorrow. So this sufficient statistic which is the which is sufficient for all the dynamics is getting squished there has to be an analog of this rate of transformation in continuous time and maybe that analog is so well behaved that it leads to the nice stieglitz policy but there are a lot of these other values of the marginal rates of substitution which don't just show up so in a sense the continu the the continuous time is is an artifact in that it's getting rid of some of the values and this must be so because in terms of non standard analysis if i take the discrete time and make the intervals into infinitesimal by transfer i should get all these phenomena <laughs> So then what is happening? Something is happening in the continuous case with those infinitesimals. And so now we are back into discrete time versus uh, continuous time. And now I will stop my little arithmetic and my little diagrams. As David Schmeidler, a very distinguished mathematical economic economist told me about when he met me in a 12 years ago or so in my office, he said, what's wrong with you? You didn't do high school geometry that you are getting all excited about these maps. And yes, it is, a, it, they are just, they are very addictive. Uh, but let me get rid of them and then show you the Xerox of, oh, Paul is here. Hi, Paul. So now I go to share screen and now I share and I have, this is the paper. So, this is the paper. Let me just show you. Let me just show you. Uh, no, no. Okay. So this is this is the this is the big paper. So I, the answer has to lie somewhere here in Jerry Kiesler's thing from discrete time to continuous time. And but of course he's doing stochastic processes. So this is a trivial stochastic process, and then he's doing lab low measure space arguments and so on. But I, I don't want to go through this. I you you uh, Mel stated the quest problem, so that is the problem. So that's one point. So that's what I wanted to accomplish. And now that I have you as a captive audience, let me take two more two more uh, minutes and uh, let me show you. Um, now, uh, you see, the, 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 let me now stop share. And Mel's map uh, is, a, uh, is a three armed map. The check map is a two armed map. And uh, Mel's map, the two arms are parallel for his theorem. So our first question was, do Mel's results go through when the arms are not parallel? And the answer is yes. You say, but why are you interested when the arms are not parallel? Because if they are not parallel, we can extend them backwards and make them meet at a point. And then we can compute certain things and construct a model. 
slightly more complicated model than the RSS. It's a two sector model the, the, the simplicity of the RSS model is labor is used to make machines and labor is used to make labor with machines is used to make the consumption. A slightly more complicated model would be labor and machines are used to make machines and labor and machines is used to make the consumption good. That we call the RSL model. Right? This doesn't matter, these acronyms. And so if we can make Mel's arms non-parallel and extend them back, we can show that there is an RSL model whose optimal path, whose optimal policy function will be those MEL maps. And then I, we would have found uh, a very well-behaved Lee York chaotic model. We, have, we would have found a model with very well-behaved Lee York chaotic properties such that except for initial values of measure zero, you could get any periodicity you like. So that is one of the papers with, uh, with Liu Chun and, uh, and Minako. And the third paper is the theorem that I'll just show you. Uh, and I'll call, that will be my last thing. And this is a theorem which we just published. And uh, I have it here. And this is the reprint. So this is the theorem. Uh, For any natural number k, okay, let me, let me, I'm sorry. For any natural number k and any positive real number epsilon, I can construct, we can construct a continuous map from 0, 1 to 0, 1, such that for any x in, in 0, 1, 0, uh, 0 1, in, for any x in the interval, x minus epsilon, x plus epsilon. So for any epsilon, I take a neighborhood of x. It contains k mutually disjoint, extremely scrambled sets of identical positive measure, homeomorphic to each other. And this involves the Cantor map. So it is a two-arm map, but the middle arm is a Cantor map. And the open problem, and this is now a pure, uh, this is not a number theoretic problem, it's a chaotic dynamics problem. Can we get piecewise linear maps? And pre presumably the answer is no, but we cannot find a counter example. <coughs> so if I may now summarize, let me just go after all of these rantings, let me go back to the, to the talk. So this is the optimal chaotic dynamics. So the point is not just any old map from the unit interval to another unit interval, but a map churned up as an optimal policy from these type of economic problems that I showed you, simple economic problems. And the RSS model I now told you, the two sector, one type of machine model, I tried to show you in a rough way the check map and uh, uh, the talk reports this, yeah, these are the things, this is the RSS model. I didn't show you the Lagarias thing, but this is high power number theory for me. He has PSO numbers, he has 11 PSO numbers, and then there are other things. So it will be very nice if we can see what this means in terms of these economic models. To do to Lagarias and company, what we did to the Nathanson maps draw their relevance for workhorse models of optimal economic growth. And then the geometry as an engine, I also showed you in my potted way. This is Mel's question, asymptotic implementation as the interval gets very, very small. And uh, some results and some references. So let's go back to the references. Uh, so, so you see, there's a lot of literature. This is the topological chaos. So this was a surprise because the Stiglitz policy was so well known and nice and suddenly you get topological chaos and there is this anything goes construction. You give me any, any periodicity you like, 
So this was really inspired by Mel. And um, then with discounting the further geometric investigation, this is the theorem I just showed you. This is a very interesting map. It is a, it is, a, I don't have time to, but it's a very interesting map I can show you. So we worked on this and we then got another condition for chaos. And this is the application of Mel's paper to, to this model. And this is another paper. And so this is topological chaos. So this gives you some, some sense. And uh, so these are the references. And this I'm just, these are just, just nothing. I, I, the basic desiderata of capital theory and so on. So I, I don't want to bore you with economics. Or, so. so there it is, Mel. I hope I didn't waste your time. No, it's very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions for our speaker? Of course, I'm available. You know, I I would love uh, to anybody, any of you get interested and any any questions. And Paul knows this. Paul and I are meeting once every week, and uh, you 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 send me the. I will try to. Uh, if you guys get interested from a number theoretic point of view or from the non-standard point of view, the non-standard two applications. Since David is here, one is this axiomatization of the criteria. What Moshe asked me. And uh, maybe it's all, all very clear and simple, but that's one thing. And the second is this asymptotic implementation. The non standard analysis can be used, I think, in for both places. So you actually use non-standard analysis in some uh, uh, essential way in what you were describing? Uh, in dynamics, non standard analysis has never been used. And um, I in this kind of dynamics, let me correct myself. In this kind of dynamics, it's never been used. But uh, in, uh, in uh, my dissertation, in 1973 dissertation, was on the application of um, non-standard analysis to uh, Walrasian economic theory. And 1972 was the proceedings of National Academy of Sciences paper by Brown and Robinson, large exchange economists. And and it's now the 50th anniversary of that. This year is the 50th anniversary of that paper. And there's a very lit, rich literature um, using, trying to formalize what do you mean by economic agents being economically and numerically negligible. And that's a large literature. We could, I could talk to you about that. And that essentially is now worked out. Everything is worked out. Uh, so you're saying uh, that, that this, uh... <laughs> use of non-standard analysis in economics goes back at least 50 years? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 1950, uh, 1972, Don Brown was my advisor and at a cocktail party, uh, he met Robinson and Robinson told him, what are you doing? He said, I'm working on economies with a measure space of atomless measure space of agents. Uh, due to Robert Auman. He said, I know Auman well, but why don't you apply non-standard analysis? And Don Brown said, what the hell is non-standard analysis? He said, I'll teach you what it is. And there we began this story. And I was a mad, reckless man who decided to work in it without having any uh, training in mathematics. So uh, people told me, you are crazy. Which econ economics department will give you a job? And as it happened, I survived. <laughs> so... <clears throat> So you also refer to this paper of mine from 1976, which uh, I had, when I saw you had used this, I was amazed because I thought no one had seen this paper uh, for 50 years nearly, and suddenly it popped up. And uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, it's, I don't know. It's a source of great inspiration for us. I mean, this anything goes paper came from there. And this recent paper, which we said, it's very, very interesting, you see, because there is in macroeconomics, there is this whole cleft stock of dissonances between the Keynesians and the non-Keynesians. The Keynesians say, you know, a certain proportion of society's savings are saved and let's get on with it. And the non-Keynesians based in Chicago with Milton Friedman leading the attack said, no, it must be well micro-founded. What the hell does it mean micro-founded? It means there must be a rational agent who's maximizing. So it became this Ramsian agent solving uh, the maximization problems. 
So the savings must be generated by some Euler-Lagrange conditions of calculus of variations problem in continuous time. And when we took your results, if we take the Keynesian format, we can replicate your results. How did we anyone ever find my result? It was just a little paper in a proceedings <laughs> in the American Math Society. You see, economists can't prove anything. So, or at least this economist cannot prove anything. So I go around <laughs> stealing from math journals. <laughs> so I, I think I read widely. But you've obviously learned a lot of mathematics since you were a graduate student. Well, uh, yeah, well, or at least learn to show that I know a lot of mathematics. <laughs> no, no, I learned. I, I learned. Yes, yes. But I, 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 I sat, Mel. I sat and I worked, and uh, uh, it's a, it's a source of great. Uh, it's a universal language. Remember, I am the, I am from Pakistan. I am from Waziristan, actually. You have not met many mathematical economists from Waziristan. <laughs> you typically meet uh, some non non savory characters, or at least as the West presents itself presents them non-savory characters from Waziristan. Not only am I from Waziristan, I was educated in Abbottabad, where uh, Osama bin Laden was apprehended. So when I saw the, the, the roads on, uh, on, uh, uh, on Western TV, on, on, on ABC News and so on, I said, oh, look, my school was there, I, I said. My school was right near there, and so on. So mathematics for me is a, it's a wonderful language to overcome uh, differences and so on. So. It's a source of great emotional thing. So I took, I almost took, so when I was an undergraduate, um, where I was, hey, they decided just, they just should start me. a program for um, bright freshmen. And um, it would include a year in social science. Huh. And so the first semester they decided they would do anthropology, economics, political science, and sociology in that order, because it was alphabetical. I so see. we had basically um, four weeks in each subject. So the economics was taught by uh, Larry Lawrence Klein, oh. who, who got a Nobel Prize a few years later. Yes, yes, I know. I he, obviously, he had this idiotic idea that if he was teaching to a class of basically freshmen who were supposed to be smart, uh, and he had four weeks. The assignment for the first week was to read Samuelson. <laughs> read Samuelson, the whole thing. <laughs> and then uh, there were a couple of other books we had to read for successive weeks. And then our, um, uh, um, and then we had to write a paper. We were, we were each given some classic in economics. Um, I had Klein's, uh, not Klein's, um, um, the, uh, what's his name? The, the British guy, general theory of- Oh, Keynes, Keynes. Keynes, yeah. I had Keynes's general theory. I was supposed to like write a paper on this. And I was supposed <laughs> to have done this all within four weeks. So the upshot is that uh, I know no economics. Uh, it used to be, I thought, that if you just use the word marginal in a sentence, people would think you knew something. Uh, <laughs> yes, but, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. You see, so I use marginal marginal rates of transformation, but here it's linear. So there you can actually compute it without any calculus. But uh, typically you have marginal this and marginal that, and all they learn is how to differentiate. So in one sense, Klein is absolutely right, but it's crazy. It should be for a year or two years or something like that. And then that's the way he should work on it. But yeah, Larry Klein. But you know, he got into, I don't know what year you are talking about, but he got uh, into difficulty with the McCarthy period and then had to go to England for some time. This was uh, in 1962. Oh, so that's when he must have returned. I think 53, yeah. 50, 52, 53, uh, he, because you see, he had the Klein model and Senator McCarthy said, but this is socialist planning. So he got into trouble. There are two economists who really got into trouble were Klein and Richard Goodwin. And Richard Goodwin from Harvard never came back. He was also now talking of chaotic dynamics. He's a, he then later became a big authority in di dynamics. But Richard Goodwin then never came back to the US. Yeah. Uh, 
Other questions for our speaker. So other questions about the world at large. <laughs> David. So, uh, Ali, this this paper of, of Kiesler's from 91, I, and it's sort of part of a, this whole thing he's been doing for decades of trying to come up with a, a, a way of, of moving between discrete and continuous objects through logic. You know, if you, if you have something that's true for discrete objects and you can characterize it in a certain way, in a certain kind of logic, then it's true for continuous objects and, and vice versa. You know, not just time for stochastic processes. He's done this for other stuff as well. Mm. And I'm just curious whether whether you know you've given any thought. I mean, I'm speaking as a logician, and I know you're 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 not a logician, but given any thought to the idea that for some of these economic things, maybe you can come up with some kind of a of a formal a formal language, so that if you've got some kind of a model, some kind of a general model that can be characterized in this formal language, then it's true in, 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 let's say, all discrete discrete structures, if and only if it's true in continuous structures. Uh, so I, I give you two answers. One is a simple answer. Paul is here, and uh, Paul is teaching me some of this stuff. And I we hope to write a paper <laughs> with this. So that's he, and he knows logic. So, so that's one answer. The other answer is um, uh, Bob Anderson, whom you know well, uh, and he has a postdoc, uh, Hausui Duanmo, yeah, yeah. and who is applying the, 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 uh, to Markov processes. So uh, we don't have a meta theorem of the kind that I hear you describing, but uh, uh, he is one dynamo, and uh, he just laps up. Uh, uh, laps up uh, finite models <laughs> and he says you give me the finite model and overnight I will get you a theorem for the infinite case and we write a paper so we are on our fifth paper <laughs> until the profession is going to throw us out <laughs> so um, uh, but if you need I think you need a good it will be nice to have a, a model theoretic thing and Kiesler the last I corresponded with him about four or five years ago and uh, you see, he's also on to this uh, relatively saturated spaces and so on. These are these Maharam types and so on. Yeah. That uh, takes away from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, non-standard analysis. It's purely standard. And these are these uh, every, they are these super atomless spaces, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, th there's big controversy. He has a paper in 2009 with Yaneng Sun in Advances in Mathematics. And um, there are some other um, uh, two European scholars who also published in 2009. And there is, was a big controversy and it became quite ugly. So I told uh, Jerry, Jerry Kriesler, I said, no, you have the prestige. Why don't you sort this out and just give, write one paragraph, this is where it all stands. And then we can just quote that paragraph and don't have to get caught up with every referee report saying I did it first and he did it first and so on. Jerry said, I will do more than that. I will take, I will write for you a survey article of all uh, of uh, model theory in economics. And he's ideally uh, suited to do this. But, but so then I got Nicholas Yanellis, who's the editor of economic theory and Yanellis uh, wrote to him and said, we will be very happy to publish it. Please write it and so on. And that was four or five years ago, uh -huh. and uh, he—I don't—he's not got back to it. But, but you, the, your your question is directly on, on on dot. And economists are now learning, and as Paul knows, they are applying propositional logic, and then these um, theorems of uh, um, Tarski and Tarski Seidenberg and Walsh's theorem and things mm -hmm. like this. And I I I don't know this stuff. But, uh, I mean, a lot of these structures he's come up with, I mean, Kiesler looks at the world a little differently than a lot of other people do. And so he produced structures that were supposed to make things simple for standard mathematicians to understand. And, and they're like the neocompact, the neo the, the neometric spaces, right? This was all supposed to be a way for people that were far away from logic to understand how to deal with, with, uh, with, with these kinds of situations. And of course, it was very, very highly you know, logic. There's, 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 it's not really very transparent for 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 non logicians. The neometric, uh, but it's quite useful. It's shown up in things like fixed point theory as well. Nice. Um, 
but it seems that that what you really need is for the for the the expert in economics to say well these are the way we like to formulate our models and and then to 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 figure out how to make how to find the right sort of language in in there i, I think you're absolutely right i mean what you're saying is is right on yeah that's paul speaking yeah yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. See, so there is room. I think we should have. Uh, there is room to get together, you know, in a uh, uh, in a in an informal atmosphere and so on. I think there is a lot of payoffs here. Whether yeah, how much it will contribute to economics, I don't know. But to, I think it will contribute to the to to the general subject at large. Well, it, it's funny. And so, so again, this is sort of for for people not not in logic. There was a. It used to be like in the in the, uh, up through say the 1970s, there was a big a, a, a big part of, of what's called model theory in, in 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 logic was coming up with logics for X, logics for topology, logic for probability. Lo so beautiful and 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 to work through basically trying to recapitulate what we know about normal logic or predicate logic, but for all these different logics. And this book was produced, um, which was a survey of many of these things called Model Theoretic Logics. It came out in maybe 1980, something like that. Completely killed the field. So this is when I was a graduate student, and this is what really attracted me to this stuff, was just this beautiful, beautiful uh, panoply of, of, of kinds of results. If you're interested in this area of math, then you can maybe try to come up with a logic for it and then you can examine it and it can have all sorts of wonderful, wonderful consequences. But the book was so good. Wow. It did such a nice, beautiful, I don't want to say complete, but it was such a crystalline uh, development of all these different logics that it made it look like a, like a, like a, a closed field. And and it kind of killed that area of that 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 area of mo of, of of model theory. There are other things that happened too. A lot of the people that are interested in this stuff were in former Yugoslavia, and then we had a war in Yugoslavia, and and that kind of scattered people around. But um, it it it's it's it, it's kind of sad because it was it was a really thriving area of logic, and it just <laughs> basically died over a period of a few of a few years. Um, but I think there's a lot there to be looked at again, as, as so often is the case, that things that, that people think are no longer interesting suddenly become interesting again some number of years later. Yes, yes, yes. But you are, you are, um, you are this accurate title, Model Theoretic Logics. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a book, it, it, John Barwise was one of the editors. I, I can't I remember the other editors. Uh, but, okay, but yeah. okay. No, you, we will check it out. I'm sure yes. maybe, uh, maybe Paul already knows it. Yeah, yeah, I'll send you a Ah, oh, there you go. Very good, guys. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, thank you very much. You very much. To be part of this group. Right. Before everyone logs off, let's see. Arindam, are you still there? This was? Maybe not. Okay. All right, all. Um, just remember, um, uh, the only way we have a seminar every week is if everyone's, if it's someone is willing to speak each week. So uh, let me know. Anyway, uh, be well all, stay healthy. Um, be back next week. Thank you Take again, care. Ali. Just in time. Take care. Bye. Take care, guys.